Um, my presentation is called The Missing Seventh Insignia. If you remember, um, the wheel. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the wheel. Oh, oh, there we go. Um, back in 2011, I presented to you on the sixth insignia of the Lafayette Escadrille and the 103rd Aero Squadron in the National Collection. Um, Uh, we talked about how this was all assembled by Paul Garber and others leading up to his wonderful presentation in 1963 of relics, mm -hmm. artifacts from mm -hmm. the Lafayette Escadrille in 103rd, given by surviving members and their families, as well as the logbooks of the Lafayette Escadrille, given by the widow of George Tino, the commander of the Lafayette Escadrille. This is the actual program from the regions that was sent to people in 1963. I have to segue and say that at every opportunity, I try to stick this in somewhere um, as a reminder, especially if uh, our um, chief curator of aeronautics, uh, Peter Jacobs, sees it, that uh, it's about time to have another great exhibit of the Lafayette Escadrille, <laughs> because uh, we're coming up, to, obviously, to the anniversary of World War One's ending. April and 1916 was when they started. February 18th, 1918 is when they ended. So hopefully, <coughs> there will be an opportunity amongst all of the celebration, or uh, remembrance, I shouldn't say celebration, but remembrance, to again have a, uh, an exhibit. That's my, my hope. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I don't think I've got the hang of it. There we go. If, if you remember, the sixth um, insignia, one is looking this way, uh, the sixth insignia are remarkably similar. Uh, and I focus especially, although you could focus on the, the, uh, the feathers of the bonnet and so forth. Um, in this instance, I, I focused back in 2011 on the, on the faces. You can see how similar they are. And as you know from, from our research and, and from what was written at the time and later, um, a stencil was designed. And it was used against the fuselage of the aircraft. And a pencil was used then to mark out where everything went. And then um, my colleague Carl Abro came up with the incredible idea, and I, I just, I mean, it's never, no one thought of this before, but having a stencil like that, and we, we think it was cut from a piece of tin, um, they could simply flip it to do the other side of the fuselage, because, as you know, the insignia always has to face towards the front of the fuselage, so when you s flip it to do the other side of the fuselage, it's it just as good. We find the pencil marks in most of the insignia. Um, you're probably thinking now I'm just, you know, recapping my 2011 presentation, but I'm getting to the seventh piece of insignia. Um, there was another donation in addition to the sixth, and that was from uh, Fred Prince, who is standing here in uni French uniform next to his brother Norman. And as you know, Norman was one of the founders, if not the sole founder, one of the founders of the Lafayette Escadrille. He died in October 1916, returning to his airfield, um, reportedly hitting wires and, and flipped and, and died. His brother, um, just uh, really right at that moment, joined the Lafayette Escadrille. Um, he had gotten his wings. He had been, uh, uh, Frederick had gotten his wings, the older brother, and, and he had been a flight instructor for a while. He joined the Lafayette Escadrille. We don't think he ever flew in combat. There's no record in the logbook of it's actually flying in combat in any sortie. Um, he was uh, quickly actually pulled from the unit and brought home, a lot having to do with uh, his father reportedly being ill. His father wasn't ill. He was trying to get him to come home. And um, um, his father tried very hard to keep him in the United States and prevent him from returning to France, but he did return to France and uh, continue in aviation, but not with the Lafayette Escadrille. 
Um, years later, Frederick, um, Freddie as he was known, the son of uh, the, the Prince family was extraordinarily wealthy. Um, Freddie donated in 1960 um, an insignia to the museum. Um, the uh, museum, if you remember from the last frame of the move, the Raiders of, Raiders of the Lost Ark in 1981, this marvelous picture of a hangar, the, um, the, the, the problem with an object, if you lose the identifier of where it is, you don't know where to find it. And this is the, the point of that picture, which I threw in here. I knew you'd appreciate it. Um, the museum's um, system back then was not computerized, obviously. It was pre-computers. It's a card file. Believe it or not, in Garber, the card file is still there. You can actually go and go through the card file. It's an amazing kind of thing. And pull up a card and uh, look for your object that way, although it's a little easier on the computer system. Um, oops, sorry. I guess not good at this. There we go. Um, um, so, I'm wondering, Carl, if I jumped ahead somehow. Um, how, how, can, I, can I go back? Or? Yeah. Oh, I could do it over here. There we go. Okay. So there we were. Um, uh, in the, in the uh, in the card file um, is a is literally a card with a notation on it. The insignia can't be found, so there's a notation on it that uh, it was loaned to Dr. Howell. Eight slash six. We don't know what eight six is, although it could possibly be August sixth. And it's loaned to Dr. Howell, and we don't know who Dr. Howell is, and we don't know what MHT stands for. This is years ago. Um, so. Um, Further research, we found that uh, there was a memo from a um, curator, and we figured out who KEM is, he was a curator at uh, the National Air Museum, and he wrote to an Edgar Howell, Dr. Howell, on August 7th, the day after August 6th, the penciled notation. Um, and he says, we've got this piece of uh, Lafayette Escadrille insignia, and you can come and get it. Well, that's not typical of the museum. You know, we don't sort of let people sort of come up and pick up something. So don't try to call and, and ask for anything. Because Blaine, you can't get it. They will, won't be at the front door. Or Blaine over there, sorry. Um, and what's an MHT? Well, so again, the penciled notation was loan to Dr. Howell, MHT 86. And we know 87, there's a letter to a Edgar Howell about come and pick it up. And we still have no idea why we would give away this piece of insignia. So um, I put my head as a researcher, I put my head back into the time of 1960 and started reading everything I could find and went through um, all the correspondence and so forth. And after a while, I discovered that MHT um, stood for Museum of um, History and Technology. And that is the precursor to the American Museum of American History. So. Um, I looked into the corporate records of the Smithsonian and found that, of course, in 1960, the uh, end of 1961, that the corporate records recorded the gift of Freddie Prince's um, insignia to the Smithsonian. So that all made sense. Then I also found two years later, it's recorded again. And then this time, it's recording it in quite specific detail. Indian head, again, given to the museum. So we've got a um, piece of fabric, and we don't know where it is, we can't find it, but it's somehow been loaned uh, or transferred to uh, Dr. Howell and Edgar Howell, and somehow at MHT, Museum of History and Technology, and uh, we find out that through further research that Dr. Howell is a curator at the American Museum, uh, Museum of American History. So for some reason, it was given to them, and that's our paper. So in 19, 
60, Freddie Prince gives the insignia to the Smithsonian and just poof, disappears. And through all of this paper trail research, we discovered, well, it was loaned or transferred across the mall to American history. Right? That, the, the, uh, whether it's going to come back across the mall to us is a subject for Peter Jacob and other people to discuss with American history, but they've got it. And at this point, we realize they've got it, and we don't. And we'd like at least to see it. And um, eventually, took some effort, a couple letters. Um, I ended up, uh, Carl suggested it was, there was, uh, there was some communication back and forth with the museum, and uh, they, they themselves uh, couldn't seem to find the fabric either of American history. And Carl one day um, suggested that I, as a private citizen, ask to see the fabric. I thought, well, that's ridiculous. If they say they don't have it, they don't have it. But he said, no, no, you don't understand. And I have to tell you honestly, this is the most amazing um, thing. Um, he said, and it's absolutely true, he said, you know, everything in this collection belongs to the American people. And any American can ask to see anything, and they'll see it eventually. Not, not tomorrow, not next week. I mean, it's a busy museum. But if, if anyone wants to see something, they, they can see it. Um, and he was right. I wrote a letter, got a letter back, made a few phone calls, and on a Monday, February 9th, I was at the museum, and on the back you can sort of scratchy handwriting. It must have been 1960 when Fred, uh, Freddie Prince donated the uh, fabric. Um, and there we are. These are not great pictures because this is in the uh, storeroom, and yeah, it's some object out of tens of thousands of objects, and it's on a cart. And what I could do is just use my iPhone and take pictures. But um, that's the insignia. And uh, see, it's slightly, it's a later design insignia. And very specifically, there is no war paint on the nose or on the cheek. If you go to this, you can see every nose, every cheek has exactly the same war paint. So that's interesting, and it matches up with a type of um, an evolution of the design that occurred after the escadrille pilots transferred to the 103rd. The insignia was officially allowed to be added to 103rd Aero Squadron aircraft, typically that was all recorded, and there, there would be a memo saying, you may use the Indian head insignia, and, and then they could use it. And the painters, we didn't have Suchet, who was the French painter, who would paint it on the aircraft, because he was back with N124. So you had somebody else painting it. But it was essentially the same design, having evolved. Here you can see, because uh, we don't have high resolution pictures, John, Eventually, I hope you will be taking delivery of this at Garber, and you will unframe it and take some great pictures for us. Well, if I could convince the curators to convince the conservation staff to, uh, yes, that's what I'm running into on the uh, on the other piece of Samson fabric. Oh, because it's under glass. And it's under plexiglass. Oh, even better. I want yeah. to tell you something about that too. So, like like that, this. Uh, you can see right here, these sort of lighter marks there are where the paint is sticking against the underside of the glass. And it's been, you know, it's been in a frame for a very long time. The red marks I superimposed show um, where the longerons are on the spad. Um, and we know when we look closely at it, you can see those. Um, we don't have a image from the back because they don't want to take it out of the frame. This photograph um, is courtesy of Adam Foley, who um, began his research here a lot earlier than I did. And uh, when I sent my research to Alan, a few hours later, this came back on email from him. And this piece of fabric is from this exact airplane. I don't mean it's from an 103rd Aero Squadron type airplane. 
or one of 20 airplanes. This is the exact airplane. And we see when we line it up that it exactly lines up. And you know from our prior presentations that uh, often what we try to do, the, the, the moment, the great moment, right, John, is when we can find that exact airplane. And we go through a lot of work in Photoshop to make sure it is exactly the same. In this case, it is. We've tested all sorts of different parameters to make sure it is correct. And here you see the two. The uh, <coughs> aircraft at a certain point were, had numbers to identify them. So if someone was, you saw someone going down or whatever, or you saw a plane coming back to the airfield, you could right away know who that pilot was because you could associate him with that number as opposed to trying to see a very small serial number. Well, in the case of the 103rd, uh, around the summer of 1918, they getting rid of the lab. They had been phasing out the personal motifs of the Lafayette boys and formally adopting yellow yep. numerals on the side, like most French units. And have. that was one of the uh, typical issues. I'm sorry, can I do that? Go after you. That's one of, one of the issues uh, Alan pointed out to me. Alan Tully that uh, the commander of the 103rd, there was friction often over certain issues of, uh, of this sort of thing, uh, not allowing um, the aircraft to be personalized in a certain way. This aircraft, very interestingly, you yeah, see has a about to point out, that's similar to a, uh, a motif that's appeared on, a, for example, uh, Brad Fairchild of uh, N1, 59 had a headrest like that on one of his new ports. Cool. I don't know if I can identify that pilot. We well, might okay. know whether that was his idea or not. But well, that, that really was something they would make allowances for as long as you <coughs> identified your plane basically the Army way. The fellow in Bethesda who has the insignia off of George Turner's one of third uh, Pat 13, and uh, it has a large, I mean, the Indian head and a big yellow T for Turner. I think I've never actually seen it, but I've seen photographs of it. Yeah, yes. I had arranged for that years ago. Yeah. That Alan uh, Tolley had uh, wow. Love to see brought that. to my attention. So, um, you know, I kind of thought when I got the picture, that was it. That was the end of it. Of course, um, as you know, John, <laughs> then you start going like, well, who is that guy in the, in the cockpit? <laughs> you know, right? And of course, so then what started, you know, this is on February 9th when I see the, in, this thing. I think I started working on this in 2009. And it took about five, six years to actually get to the point of seeing the, uh, the fabric. And then Alan finds the picture, and I think, okay, we're done. And then I'm thinking, wait a second. Okay. If, if he had just not been in the cockpit, or if he had just been looking other way so we couldn't see his face. Photoshop, where are you when we need you? <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, Alan points out it's a Kellner built SPAT 13. It's not a Blurio or whatever. And so then you start looking up the, the logbook of the, as you know, it's the Escadrille is available online. And San Diego has now uh, scanned and digitized the um, logbook of the 103rd. And of course, there are the Gorel reports um, of patrols as well as the end of day reports where they would talk about what was available and what you know was taken off the line because they had to work on an engine or whatever. So unfortunately, you don't see until much later when they're recording things. Um, don't come across that they actually also recorded the number. So a two would come along, you waste that plane on, on a landing or something, and then somebody would say, okay, well, we're going to now make this other plane two. And so there are very various twos in the 103rd Aero Squadron. Yeah, Some of them we are... We can narrow them down at least to the <coughs> calendar building. Yep. The serial number. And the uh, Blerios... We've got a couple of Blerios, so we know it's not that. Because when, you know, from the calendar, you can tell from the, uh, from the uh, 
design with a lot of camouflage and so forth, um, you can tell a lot about the aircraft. We also have gone to the extent of, actually Alan doesn't know this, so if you talk to him tonight, don't tell him this part, okay? But actually this uh, uh, piece right up here with all the holes in it, when you look at it at very, very high resolution, you realize it's really been banged. Something's really happened to it. Um, so, you know, you can start putting together various bits and pieces of what's happened to this aircraft. You can see the two on the wing. Um, there are various uh, things here. There's a, sometimes there would be something written here, a, a girl's name, uh, Edgar Tobin wrote. Uh, his, uh, I think his mom was named Ruth and his sister was named Ruth, and so you saw Ruth on this plane. His wife wasn't named Ruth, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't put it there. But, um, and uh, for a while, I mean, there's something in this picture. There's also a calendar data plate that, that in some calendar it's there, and some it's to the right. But there's also the possibility of a uh, fraternity mark on that data plate. But I haven't really been able to tease that out very well. Um, so Alan and I have spent a lot of time back and forth, back and forth. And we would love it if other people would get involved going through each and every member, even ground staff, of the 103rd. So I'm going to give you the ones that were the, the two closest we've gotten so, so far. This is um, Doreen Dink Parsons Wardwell. And um, that's our pilot in the middle. And this is Dink. Okay? And the reason he is looking really likely is there is a counter-built SPAD-13. It's definitely a SPAD-13, right? And it's definitely, definitely very likely counter-built. And it's marked number two. And we know this because in, we know he's flying it. And then in his um, compendium of his letters to his wife and in his writings in his diary, which are now in the Library of Congress, his daughter, Marjorie, compiled them and gave them to the Library of Congress. And they're in this uh, Library of Congress um, veterans section, and they're digitized. Um, and I found that just doing a Google search. Unfortunately, pages 73 and 4 are missing, literally at the point that we get to him recording that the plane that he's just been given in the end of July 1918 has a two on it. And you can see here he's talking to his wife. I've just gotten this plane. Brand new machine given to me with a more powerful motor, <coughs> motor and two machine guns. I've flown it yet. I haven't flown it yet. On tomorrow's good day. And we, we know that that plane from the records of the squadron was 4517. And then in his diary, it's taken its last flight, number two, a couple days later. And he's, he's dinged it up. Poor judgment on his part. And then, that's in his diary, and then in his letter, August 2nd, you see it's the 27th of July, 30th, and the 2nd of August, he's writing to his wife, and he says 23 was assigned to him. He's talking about busting it up. So is it number 2 or number 23? And it's looking unlikely to have been 23, that 23 would have cycled into the numbers that are coming off because planes have been lost or damaged and now being reassigned, it doesn't look like 23 would have been assigned then. So it does look like two. Unfortunately, at the bottom of the page, we literally come up to this word, and the next page is missing, and so is the following page. Fortunately, because of the internet, we're able to actually reach out to Marjorie, his daughter, Marjorie, um, her second husband's son. And he just retired um, from his investment firm in Seattle. And he's going through all of her papers and trying to find an original copy of what she gave the Library of Congress. Because when they transcribed it, digitized it, they didn't realize that two pages were missing. And no one's pointed that out to them yet. So we're hopefully she will, or he will find those. And we'll be able to figure out, is it 23 or is it 2? But he's looking good, although he doesn't look like the pilot. 
could very well be that, I mean, it's possible that he was the ferry pilot, and, and it's really not significant in all of this. Except we come to this, Eugene, Gene, as he was known, Jones, who got shot down in um, September. But before that, um, one of the problems, as you know, with the internet, when you talk to your children about it is, they're doing a school paper, they can go to Wikipedia and there's all this great information, except it could be wrong. And Wikipedia wrong? How could that be? Well, <laughs> if my daughters decide to apply to Northwestern, I'm going to have a second thought about it because the people who lay out the Northwestern College yearbook had to have been the worst layout people because they've got all the pictures are mixed up. So initially, when we found a picture, and compared it, um, we're trying to find a younger picture as opposed to a later picture and trying to compare it to the picture of the pilot. We um, come up with Jones looking very, very, very different in the yearbook. And there's some, someone two pictures over who looks closer to our pilot. But that was in the back of my mind. And then we ended up going back and finding out, <coughs> taking the five guys in the yearbook that. I mean, he's literally 21 years old, Jones, in this yearbook picture in 1916. Okay, so he's like a little older than a lot of the pilots. It looks like a babe. I mean, really looks like a little kid, right? But that's him at 21. And we find that out after going through a lot of, you know, a lot of research. Um, actually, now I shouldn't say we because Alan thinks I'm absolutely nuts doing this kind of thing. But I go on Ancestry.com and get these yearbooks and you can compare the pictures. And so we know this is definitely Eugene Jones. And this is our pilot. And you know, with all of them, we've gone through the entire squadron, okay? And no one is the pilot. But when you take this picture and that picture and you allow 25% of the image to come through, flipped, we had to flip it because he's looking the other way. You allow 25% to overflow, over the flap, and then 50%, and then 100%, that's what you get. And so, although it doesn't appear to be the same pilot, um, it seems to lay out really well in terms of nose and eyes and how they're related to each other. And that, the 25 cents will get you a ride on the subway because it still doesn't <laughs> get us to who this guy is. And uh, that's where we are. So if anyone has ideas, um, please. I've been there. taking down serial numbers, and whenever I can find them, uh, side numbers, I'm going to go back and look through. Uh, let's see which planes are attributed to Wardwell and Jones, if I got them, and I'll let you know. Okay, that'd be great. Um, Alan, uh, I don't think he would mind me telling you this. The San Diego copy, apparently is not available unless you call San Diego. You can't download it from the site of the 103rd logbook. Um, Alan got a copy years ago, and he literally transcribed all of it. Um, so he has on an Excel spreadsheet, he's got pilot and aircraft and so forth, and all this stuff. And it's a, you know, all this is like a huge amount, but the, the absolute critical thing is finding a photograph, if we ever can, and matching it up. And it doesn't even have to have had the insignia added yet, or sometimes we know, like with uh, Robert Subrin's um, SPAD 7 that we have the fabric from. Um, we know that the fabric matches photographs of his airplane perfectly, except the serial numbers moves about. So we know at certain points the planes would be damaged and they would repaint them, some parts of them, um, and they would move the serial number. And one of the reasons they typically move the serial number, and we found this with the DFWs, the uh, um, um, DFWC5? Yeah, that because a lot of times the serials would be placed, you can't see it in this picture, they'd be tucked under the empennage, you couldn't see them. So then if there was some reason they needed to repaint, you know, bullet holes or whatever, they pull the serial number forward. The Germans did it, and, this, and, and we did it with the spats. We pull it forward. So, and there's always the possibility that there was damage, and whoever repainted after the damage repainted with. Um, a Kellner design as opposed to a Blériot camouflage design. But in this case, it would be really weird if this was a Blériot because 
the other parts that make it a calendar that don't line up. So we really do think it's a calendar. Um, so if you have pictures we, or anything that talks to a calendar number two, that would be great. Okay, one other thing I'd see is possibly going against it being uh, Dink uh, Wardwell. Uh, you said that uh, you can spot a dent on that uh, forward uh, yeah. through yeah. roots. Yeah. And because he said it was a brand new plane. Yeah. And the other the other point is, uh, notice all the exhaust streak, or exhaust or oil streaking down there. Yeah. Now possibly yeah. if if he said if as he was saying in the second part uh, that. Um, he was attributing it to what was it, uh, um, his poor performance, and then also uh, engine problems, didn't he say? Yeah. I uh, showed poor judgment and bust up. Luckily, nothing more than a fair sized headache. Poor That's judgment and motor failure is a crucial moment. That was part, and then if that. If that's that, I suppose that streaking could have been symptomatic of the problem with the engine developing. But uh, but on, otherwise, what? but on the other hand, it uh, looks like that had been going there for a while. Yeah. You're, you're talking about this right here, right? Going right. Yeah, going right back right through. Back yeah. It, 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 yeah, it does. And he said it was a brand new plane. Yeah. Very good point, John. Do the one third uh, day uh, flight records uh, list what, what the launch hangars do? I know the bomber squadrons have pulled from the drill before. They list not only the bombing missions, but also the training missions, and if they have any accidents and breakups of those, with the serial number and also sometimes their real change number on the side. The logbook? Um, no, not necessarily the logbook proper, but in the drill report. Oh, the in, the report daily, report, yeah. in, in the uh, bombing squadrons, it was the daily raid report. Filled out by the, uh, the the operations officer the squad. The the, the um, unfortunately, you know, with uh, with Gorel, you, you have some and you don't have others, so you don't get this wonderful. You, it would be if we had them all, it would be wonderful. We could really lay it out, and um, the records don't record the actual plane ID number until like late September, early October. They don't start recording it. Um, uh, so we have to sort of like work back from that and try to figure out what those numbers were. Um, so we're at the point where we have two Blerios that are number two. We really don't think it's that. We've got um, the uh, Wardwell number that... Um, uh, two or 43. Yeah, that, that um, could, could very well be it, except for the fact, yes, that it's... You know, um, I mean, they may have used some other material on the airplane that was damaged. That seems kind of unlikely. Um, so, and we also kind of think, Alan points out that, you know, Wardwell, um, being able to decorate your plane, you know, with some of the older pilots and more successful pilots, yeah, that's so kind of likely. Yeah, you'd before you would write that. Yeah, so it's kind of hard to see yourself. how Wardwell could have, you know, could have rated it. Yeah. So one other thing on the side numbers and whatever, uh, you sometimes get personality influence. The squadron commander gets a brand new airplane. I'm going to have that one, and I'm going to be number one because I'm I'm the commander. Yeah. And the executive's going to be number two, and the operations officer's going to be number three. This didn't always happen, but mm -hmm. I can see where it had. I, I've known cases where it has happened in yeah. more contemporary times. That's a good, very, very good point. If the question is: Is the person who's sitting in this airplane? Uh, a member of the 103rd, or is it someone, and even if it's his own plane, right. you know, some of the planes were shared uh, with other, you know, rotation, or he could have, it could have been a cameo shot, we don't know. We do know it's this plane. Yes, definitely this plane. And and one, one thing I should add, I, I don't put it in my notes, because, in, in the presentation, because it, you know, a lot of times these get shared and, and are, are moved around and stuff. But um, it appears that, um, you know, in 1960, Freddie Prince was an older man. He was uh, died a couple of years later. 
you know, memory, memory is fragile. So um, in the accession records and correspondence in which he records it as either being from his brother's airplane, which would have been October 1916 or earlier, um, or from one of his airplanes, and he never flew with the 103rd, he's gotten this mistaken because it's clearly not from the plane that his brother could have ever flown in October 1960. Because they hadn't adopted the Indian head yet. Right. Charlie, no, is, is, that, is that in, uh, does, is that his handwriting in a letter saying that it was his brother's, or is it um, something that is uh, attributed Good point. I think it was in the um, um, attributing to his brother um, when he gave the donation. There were 18 pieces that he donated, and I think in figuring out which pieces which um, in that donation, it got a little confused. Yeah, I, was, I think I remember looking at the accession records when we started playing around with this, and there were places where it was supposed to be from Norman, and other places where it was supposed to be Frederick. And neither of them really synced up with that being from the hundred and third, because neither of them yeah. they weren't. I mean, would have made that would have made that time frame. You have to understand that uh, we do, um, and very well at some point might have in this in this room um, family members of the Prince family, and they've come and walked through Garber, and um, uh, we've we've corresponded with them and talked to them and so forth. So. Issues of attribution suddenly become very, very um, close, very, very much at home because, you know, I wouldn't want to say that Freddie Prince or Nor you know, would, would try to attribute this to something that's, you know, he's not necessarily making it up. It's just that he's confused. Is this my airplane or was it Norman's or was it some other airplane? But we know he says here N124 insignia, right? We don't think that's possible because this. Okay. So stop there. So yeah. here, here is N124 eventually adopted a Sioux head. Yes. Okay. So the first by, by, by just saying N124 insignia, that's the N124 insignia. Okay. That's not the ins one from right. an N124. That's just the insignia. Right. The, exactly. Because it's all one and the same. It's right. the Indian head. And right. it doesn't matter whether it's the the um, the uh, old lady, right, or, right, the, or, the very or first or one, the fierce warrior, right. it, you know, right. it's the N124. So take it, don't take it literally, take it figuratively. So he, he writes here N120, and it kind of looks like it. It's a very, um, it's a, the kind of shaky, very shaky kind of handwriting. It says N124 insignia from F Prince's Frederick Prince's F Prince's plane, and then it says my, you have to excuse my French. Sematier de Bioche, B I A C H E, 1917. Sematier de Bioche, when you look it up, is a uh, uh, location far, far to the west of any 103rd um, airfield. It's a cemetery for um, uh, a war cemetery um, for victims of World War I. So, you know, why he would write that on there. But um, it, you know, possibly it was near, uh, you know, um, a salvage center where he saw the airplane and cut the piece off, or who, who knows? We, I mean, we really don't. If the piece comes back to us from American history, um, whether it's a loan or a transfer or just out of the good nature they decide to store it with us as opposed to there, hopefully, conservation can remove it from the frame which will allow us to see the back. And as you know, when you see the back, you can see the lingeries and so forth. There may be some indication on the back of where it's from. Uh, so you know, we, there's always the possibility that we'll learn more. Thank you, Trump. One other yeah. thing I think, yeah. Your the secret to cracking this is the Prince family. Because yeah, even if it's one of those pilots that you think, you would have had to physically be there. Yeah. Freddie Prince would have had I would recommend is if you can't get it, the Prince family was nuts, as we all know, about their obsession with gas control. The number of times they did very important articles are legendary. But you know, either they must have had an archive, and chances are there's some correspondence that supports it. If not, you may want to go take a day trip down to Washington Lee to go through Paul Rockwell's papers, because Paul Rockwell has 15 boxes 
correspondence with all of these aviators up to the yeah. time of his death. He's yeah. the official historian. Right. Somebody's going to mention this. It just, it, you know, correspondence, there's letters down there between him and Freddie. So right. you, you may find it buried there. It's a lot of work. Yeah. But I think it's cool. Yeah, it'd be great to find out. One other thing I think to see that might be of help in tying pinpointing the aircraft. Uh, that photo of the aircraft, it looks like it's got a two on the upper wing in a darker color. Oh, it does look darker. Yeah. Yeah. Even allowing for the angle. Right. Very good point. I didn't even see many eyes. We really gained a lot of eyes on this. Alan, uh, Pointed out that those he thinks those are sevens in the back, those two airplanes in the back, which kind of gets you to like, well, where would you have the sevens and the thirteens together? Well, the one, well, well, like you said, yeah, well, that is a new seven high, right new high behind pilot. it. Yeah. Well, like you said, and like uh, um, Dink said in his letter about uh, moving to a new higher powered engine. And, and, two right, right. and the two guns as opposed Which to one on the seven to thirteen. Yeah. yeah. June, July, the one oh third was uh, replacing the last of its uh, sevens. Yeah. Sevens with thirteens, because unlike the French, we didn't keep a backup of sevens. This in picture is actually from um, University uh, the University of Texas at uh, Dallas. Uh, you know the whole collection that Furco. Furco. collection down there. It's not Furcos, but it's one of the other ones, and that's where Alan got it. And um, what I realized actually, uh, one of the reasons I was late today, one of the I had a list of loose ends, and um, I realized that uh, when he sent me the photo, uh, photo, photo, it's labeled a certain way, and then it says close up. I'm wondering if this photo has been cropped, uh -huh. and if there's another version that might show us more like. You know, more of a lineup. I have to tell. Yeah, exactly. There is a film actually of the 103rd's planes, and the very first plane you see is a number two, <laughs> and it's the pilots from a different unit are standing in front of the lineup, and they're just doing it for the photographers, for the the, the film people who are making the film. So if you got, there are several websites that have. Uh, films and you can look and you'll find the 103rd and if you look into it you'll find that the pilots are not from the 103rd but the airplanes are and you'll see a number two that's not this it's a blurio number two in the film just so you know um, it's a counter number two we need not a blurio but yeah as to as to his writing on the back of as to what we think you think is Fred Prince's writing on the back of the picture I mean remember the Samson fabric uh, from uh, Blair Thaw's uh, aircraft that Ford Meyer wrote on the back that this is the plane that Blair Thaw was killed in and that Ford Meyer had both legs broken in the, when it crashed, that it was an American DF-14, and uh, it wasn't. It was from Blair Thaw, it was an earlier Blair Thaw crash when he was in first arrow, not the 135th. So, even if it, you know, no matter when it came in, the uh, yeah. memory stayed. And that one had a very complicated, I think. Uh, and what he was part of N-124 for that short period of time. Yeah, right? he was. So yeah. if you take figuratively what he wrote in the back there, that this emblem is from uh, N-124, yeah. uh, from him being part of that, yeah. Yeah, that, that is what it is. That, that was an insignia when he was in the N124, and that's all. Right, right. Right, and not literally. Not that it's that from his, his plane. Right. 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 So that's another. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Charlie.